metaphysical function. Uh, to put it in the words of uh, poet Percy Shelley, the one remains, the many change and pass. Heaven's light forever shines while earth's shadows fly. Life like a dome of many colored glass stains the white radiance of eternity until death tramples it to fragments. This is the idea that, and this is consistent with the great fundamental insight of Hindu, the entire Hindu vision of the cosmos. The world as we see it is a prism staining the white radiance of eternity. And that radiance is not visible unless there's a way to get rid of the prism. The prism is called Maya in India. The forms that appear to us in space and time, spread out in space and flowing through time, are really an illusion. Maya is the goddess who brings forth form. She is the vehicle through which forms come into manifestation. But she is concealing a mystery. And when we unveil the goddess, we find that the mystery is the primary clear radiance spoken of the Book of the Dead. The primary clear radiance, the fundamental manifestation of the radiant energies of being. And the Hindus say, Maya is concealing Brahman, and Brahman is etymologically related to a root word, Purr, which means energy. So it sounds a little bit like Einstein's conception now of fundamental unified mass energy. The only difference with the Hindus is that this Brahman is conscious and intelligent and purposive. They say that Brahman is being, consciousness, and bliss. We are rooted in rapture. The universe is pouring forth forms, pouring forth forms as this rapturous morphogenetic creation. And it makes no difference what happens to the forms. It does not, uh, it is even, it is the affirmation of life through suffering, regardless of suffering. Suffering is seen to be a secondary effect of the cosmogenetic process, which is the rapture of coming into being to begin with. So that's the fundamental metaphysical insight of mythology. The second function of traditional mythologies is what might be termed the cosmological function, and this is the one with which we are concerned here tonight. And this differs. The metaphysical function does not. The metaphysical function is what the masks of God are concealing. It is the same. Uh, this is known as the perennial philosophy. And when you peel away the different cosmologies and you compare and contrast the differences between the different religions, you will find, ultimately, that they are saying the same thing if they are interpreted this way and not interpreted concretistically. These images should become transparent to the transcendent. Now, the differences in the cosmologies of the cultures is a function of their historical contingency. Each of the high civilizations has originated in a particular time and in a particular place. And the cosmology, the vision of what the world looks like, springs forth like a flower from out of the imagination of that culture and will bear, just as the uh, individual that is raised by its mother will take on many of the neuroses of the mother, so too the cosmology will bear the idiosyncrasies of the geographical environment. And um, it's almost as though we were talking about a single, one basic species that has adapted itself to different geographical locations, uh, like a plant that has adapted itself in a certain way to live in a mountain environment, and we find the same species living in a uh, tropical environment or a desert environment, and its morphology is slightly different. It's been altered to suit the exigencies of that environment, but it's fundamentally the same species. And the different cosmologies, we can look back at the history of the primary cosmological visions. We can start even with the Paleolithic and say, well, the primary cosmo cosmological concern of Paleolithic man was relating to the animal herd. The world was built out of the mystery of the animals. This is why the mammoth hunters would build huge bone houses out of the bones of their hunted woolly mammoths. For them, the animal was the cosmos within which they lived. They would hunt the animal, cut it apart, and make things out of it. You never wasted anything. Every little part of the animal that got would be sewn and would make a special type of sack. They were living within the animal, and that was the primary cosmology of Paleolithic man for millennia beyond camp. This was um, the idea, too, that the animal in the hunt is offering itself willingly. There is a kind of covenant between the animal and the human being such that if the rites are performed in a certain way, the, the magic of the hunting rites, and the animal is revered and propitiated, its blood is returned to the earth, 
then nature will respond, the goddess, by recycling the animal. The animal is actually not dying. It is almost as though there is a revolving door through which the animal comes into being, is slain, and goes out of being, and comes back again. It's the same animal. They keep coming back, just as the stars at night keep returning. And these analogies were deliberate between the returning stars that the early rising sun would slay, but then they would return again the next night. So too, the hunter was carrying out the will of nature and hunting these animals. And this vision of the animal master, the sort of voice that lived within the species of, let's say, the woolly mammoth, would come to the shaman and speak to him and validate the covenant. And that would uh, sanctify the hunt itself so that the primary ritual in this culture is the hunt. Actually, hunting and killing the animal is the sacred ritual. And that's the cosmology of the Paleolithic. But by the time we move into the agricultural revolution, about 10,000 BC, a new concern comes into being. We have a new technology, and that is planting. And so the new mystery comes into being. These plants are coming up out of the soil. And there is a way in which this can be done such that they will come up more efficiently than at other times. Perhaps there are beings in these plants. And so it was imagined that living within these plants were beings. And this is the whole mythology, the Dionysus culture, a late echo of this. Dionysus is the god living in the grave that is smashed apart to make the wine. And hence you get the mythology of the tearing apart of Dionysus and his resurrection. And that is back behind even the Christ image. Um, so you get this idea now that there was a primordial being that was living in the beginning of the dream time before anything. And this being gave itself willingly to be sacrificed and is then planted into the ground and springs up as the primary food plant of the population. There's a little Polynesian story that illustrates this. Um, there's a girl who has gone to swim in her favorite well, and this being comes to her in human form, and uh, actually it starts as an eel that sort of brushes past her and transforms himself into a human and becomes her well. And she returns to this pond <clears throat> night after night, and. Uh, makes love with this eel human, who one night, for some mysterious reason, says to her, I'm going to come to you the next night, and I want you to cut off my head and plant it. She acquiesces. She kills him, cuts off his head, plants it in the ground, and up springs the coconut tree. And you can still see the god's face in the little coconuts. That's the Newman, the being, that is living in the primary food plant upon which the particular tribe in question depends for its survival. So we get a whole new mythology here of the planted world and the myth of the sacrifice. This is the dark, Dionysiac, bloodthirsty myth from out of which the whole concept of human sacrifice comes. Because the sacrificed human being is the ritual reenactment of that primordial being whose head was cut off or who was torn to pieces to bring about the beneficent fruct fructification of the earth from the food plant. By about 4,000 BC, we have the formation of cities in the Near East, in the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley. The first cities come into being Ur and Erech and Eridu. And these cities have a totally new set of concerns. Now there is a very complicated society with a division of labor and a specialization of labor. And a priesthood comes into being where, for the first time, writing and mathematics is invented and astronomy. And there comes a recognition, and this is where astrology originated, was out of this vision, a study of the will of the planets. They always return the same with respect to the background constellations. And out of this comes the idea that there is a destiny in the cosmos, a will within the cosmos. And so there became a kind of fascination of these planets within the courts, and you find that the king and the queen enact these ceremonies where they pretend they are planets. The king will dress uh, either as the moon or as the sun, depending on the particular god that is emphasized, and they will drink poison, and the entire court will commit mass suicide. That is, the grave will be, the top will be put on the grave, and that is the end of a cosmic cycle. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 